Hi, Joel MD here, also known as Dr. Bones of the survival medicine website doomandbloom.net, co-author of the greatly expanded Amazon Top 20, fourth edition of the Survival Medicine Handbook, a designer of medical kits made specifically for the survival medic at store.doomandbloom.net. One of the most common questions we receive from readers, listeners, and viewers is how to deal with diabetes, officially known as diabetes mellitus, in a grid down scenario. This video is the first in a series all about this serious condition. Diabetes is problematic for the survival medic. The medications used to treat the worst cases are unlikely, one, to be manufactured, or two, keep their potency in a long-term survival scenario. I'm not just interested professionally, though. I am also a father who had a severely diabetic son with kidney failure, partial blindness, and an amputated toe. He required a kidney and pancreas transplant just to stay alive. Diabetes comes from the Greek word for to pass through, and mellitus comes from the Latin word for honeyed or sweet. These words refer to one of the most common characteristics of diabetes mellitus, and that is large amounts of sweet-smelling urine. Early physicians noticed that it even attracted ants. Diabetes is also characterized by high sugar, also known as glucose levels, in the blood. I'm sure most people have heard of carbs and the importance of eating a balanced diet. Carbs or carbohydrates come in many forms and most foods have some carbohydrate content. All carbohydrates are broken down into simple glucose in your body, some faster and some slower. The resulting glucose ends up in the blood. The pancreas is a large gland that's located behind your stomach and it's in front of your spine. Certain cells in it monitor the glucose in the blood and release a hormone known as insulin. Insulin is necessary to move the sugar from the blood into the body's cells. Here it can be converted to energy. If insulin is unable to control high glucose levels in the blood, also known as hyperglycemia, damage occurs. The various organ systems involved include eyes, heart, kidney, circulation, nerves, just a lot. The incidence of diabetes has been increasing over time in developed countries. This may be due to some societies converting to Western diets or perhaps due to issues relating to rising obesity rates. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, in 2011, there were 25.8 million Americans with the disease. 10 years later, the number had risen to 37.3 million, or 11.5% of all U.S. adults. 96 million are thought by the CDC to be pre-diabetic. The recent pandemic didn't help the numbers. A large new study showed that people who were infected were 40% more likely to become newly diagnosed diabetics compared to the general population. The study identified the disease in many young adults who were otherwise healthy before being infected. Diabetes is separated into various types, the most common of which is type 1 and type 2. Known in the past as juvenile onset or insulin-dependent diabetes, type 1 diabetes results from the failure of cells called beta cells in the pancreas to produce insulin. Type 1 represents about 5-10% to of all diabetics. Failure or destruction of beta cells is thought to be caused by some type of autoimmune response. That means that the body's own immune system attacks parts of itself. In this case, the pancreas. Type 1 diabetes is most often diagnosed in childhood as it was with my son at age 8. However, today, 60% of new cases are found in those who are over the age of 40. These patients need insulin from an external source. As of yet, there is no way to regenerate the lost pancreatic cells. Type 2 diabetes was known in the past as adult onset or non-insulin dependent diabetes. In this disease, the pancreas produces insulin, but your body is resistant to its effect. Type 2 diabetics may require some oral medications or even insulin to keep glucose under control. Lifestyle and dietary changes are often helpful in this form of diabetes. They may even reverse the course or at a minimum prevent worsening. The increased incidence of obesity these days is causing type 2 diabetes even in children. Type 2 diabetes is far and away the most common type. Then there's pregnancy-related diabetes. That's a condition not uncommon even in normally non-diabetic women. In some cases, it can be serious enough to lead to organ damage or overly large babies, causing delivery complications and worse. Most women with pregnancy-related diabetes go back to normal after the baby is born. But some studies show that those women are prone to diabetes later in life. Interestingly, a new study suggests it's possible that the coronavirus may selectively target beta cells in the pancreas and may even morph them into another type of cell that leads to a new version of diabetes that isn't either type 1 or type 2. The research for this is still in progress. It's important to recognize the signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia, or elevated sugars. 
The three most classic symptoms of diabetes are one, excessive thirst, also called polydipsia, two, excessive hunger, also called polyphagia, and three, frequent urination, also called polyuria. These are exactly the symptoms that my son began to manifest at age eight. As well, I noticed that he began to wet the bed. His urine smelled vaguely sweet, a sign that I mentioned earlier. He was losing weight, and his breath had an unusual fruity odor. Why do diabetics have fruity breath? When your body can't access energy from glucose in cells, leading to very high levels in the blood, it burns fat instead. The fat burning process causes a buildup of acids in your blood called ketones, which can lead to a life-threatening condition called diabetic ketoacidosis. Fruity smelling breath is a sign of high levels of ketones. Other issues occur as well. Cuts and scrapes, especially in a diabetic's lower extremities, are very slow to heal. Over time, nerve damage occurs, which causes numbness, pins and needle sensations, and in the worst case, gangrene. Many uncontrolled diabetics require amputation of gangrenous extremities. While many diabetic complications take time to develop, there are two common diabetic emergencies. These are related to either very low or very high glucose levels. If a diabetic, especially type 1, fails to eat regularly or injects too much insulin, he or she may develop a hypoglycemic reaction, that is, low blood sugar. Hypoglycemia can occur very rapidly. Symptoms include sweating, loss of coordination, confusion, even loss of consciousness. On the other hand, very high glucose levels lead to a condition called, as I mentioned before, diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. This occurs as a result of missed insulin doses and or chronically underdosed insulin, leading to a combination of high glucose levels and high ketone levels. In addition to the symptoms of diabetes I previously mentioned, there will be nausea, vomiting, dehydration, hyperventilation, and abdominal pain as well. This is a major emergency which could lead to coma and even death in the patient. Once the patient is in full-blown ketoacidosis, the prognosis is grave without insulin and other interventions. Now that you have a good overview of the disease, our next video in this series will concentrate on other aspects of diabetes. Ultimately, we'll discuss both conventional and alternative strategies for each type. We'll work on situations where you have limited supplies and no way to monitor glucose levels, a serious handicap for the medic in long-term survival settings. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health and good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, learn more about diabetes and many other medical issues with the greatly expanded Amazon Top 20, fourth edition of the Survival Medicine Handbook, the essential guide for when help is not on the way. You'll be glad you did.